Welcome back to another episode of The Founder, a show that features entrepreneurs and their early stories of ingenuity, struggle, and perseverance to get their companies off the ground. We do our best to capture the uncensored, uncovered look behind the curtain into what founders really face when getting started. I'm your host, Callaway. Our founder guest on today's episode grew up in New York and ended up at Siena College on a lacrosse scholarship. Although sports were his main focus and he wasn't a huge fan of school growing up, he eventually wound up as an intern at an investment bank on Wall Street. He loved it. To him, the culture at the bank felt similar to his time playing sports, competitive, fast paced, and heavily reliant on a strong team. When he started full time on the sales side at the investment bank after college, he covered e-commerce and specifically the transition from brick and mortar to online. In 2016, his firm produced the first report on the cannabis space, and after reading it cover to cover, he realized what a massive opportunity existed. As someone who had always wanted to start his own company, it was at this moment that he had the spark for Highline Wellness. Today at Highline Wellness, this founder and his team are on a mission to change the negative stigma around cannabis. At their core, they strongly believe cannabis is medicine and that it has the potential to improve millions of lives across the world. All of their CBD products have 0% THC, are non-psychoactive, and use the highest quality, clean ingredients. In addition to a variety of topicals and oils, they formulated some of their gummies with functional ingredients like caffeine for jitter-free energy or melatonin to enhance your bedtime routine. While Highland is just in its second year of business, the team has already taken a foothold as one of the premier CBD brands in the country. And they're not stopping there. They have huge plans to grow into a massive company focused on total wellness delivered through plant-based medicine. And as a special offer for our listeners, I teamed up with this founder to get you 15% off all of their products. Just use code FOUNDER15 at checkout to take advantage. This is an inspiring interview that shines a positive spotlight on cannabis and the beneficial effects of plant-based medicine. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Now introducing the founder of Highline Wellness, Chris Roth. Let's get it. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm really stoked to get into it today. So, you know, before we dive into the origin story for Highline, I'd love for you to just start with a, a snapshot of the company. So if you could go through kind of what's the what's the mission of the company, talk a little bit about the products you sell and kind of how big the company is via employees or, or any KPI you use to define growth. Yeah, absolutely. So Highline Wellness is on a mission to change the negative stigma around cannabis and plants and to start opening people's minds up to using cannabis as medicine. And so we are a CBD company. We have absolutely zero THC in all of our products. Um, and our mission is to help improve the quality of life of our customers through natural, affordable, and effective products. And so from a business perspective, we are a we like to refer to ourselves as a direct to consumer company with a few exceptions. And so we built our brand online. We launched in January of 2019. So we've been around just shy of two years. Um, we are, we have been three full-time employees um, with a lot of partners that we work with very closely. We just recently hired our fourth empo- uh, full-time employee and um you know it's been it's been a great you know launch so far and um you know we're excited for what's to come awesome yeah it's it's a great anchor point and, and we're we're pumped to break down the business and kind of learn more about the the components so i think to start let's let's rewind the clock a bit as fast or as slow as you'd like take us through your your kind of life and and background leading up to coming up with the idea for Highline and, and actually starting the company. Yeah, for sure. So I grew up in a town called Northport on Long Island. I have two amazing parents and an amazing sister. So I was very fortunate to have parents and a family that supported me and believed in me. Um, growing up, I was really not a fan of school. I liked playing sports. Um, that was really all I cared about. I got call my mom got calls from my teachers pretty much 
routinely my entire childhood saying Chris is looking out the window and he doesn't seem to be interested in class. And so, you know, from a, from a young age, I sort of got used to people in my life that were important or their opinions were supposed to be important um, and got really used to being okay with, uh, with maybe not adhering to getting the best grades or, you know, applying myself fully to school. And I really focused on sports uh, instead. And I got a scholarship to Siena College on a lacrosse scholarship and spent four years there and studied finance. And at Siena, I was introduced to an alumni who got me an internship at an investment bank um, going into my junior year of college. And that was really, you know, before that, I had been um, like training um, kids for lacrosse and doing summer sort of internships that were all based around sports. And that was my first time really in a business, true business setting in Wall Street in New York City, really sort of just getting thrown into it. And I loved it. And I, I found a lot of similarities between that culture and sports of just being on a team and being ultra competitive every day was really something new you're reacting to the market or trying to be ahead of the market and i and i loved it and so um i you know did two internships there and right out of school i started at cowan which is an investment bank located in new york city i did not do investment banking i was in sales and so my job was to sell the research at the investment bank and at the time, we covered 750 different stocks and across 40 different sectors. And I really focused on um, e-commerce and specifically the shift from brick and mortar to e-commerce and how who the new winners would be and who the losers would be, uh, i.e. department stores and things of that nature. And um, in 2016, I, uh, we were the first U.S. investment bank to write research on cannabis. And so we came out with a 200 page report and I had been consuming THC for a better part of my life. I'm a massive fan. I think I, it, I've been using it medicinally and I, I've always thought that the perception around it didn't necessarily match the reality. And then I had a 200 page document sort of confirming that through hard data. And I found it fascinating. Um, I think prior to that, I had sort of made the commitment to myself that I did want to start a company and that I loved doing what I was doing at the investment bank. But I, you know, at maybe 23 or 24, set the goal for myself that I would leave to go and try and start a company before the age of 30. And so when cannabis was presented to me, I had knowledge that was sort of hard to come by in the form of the research that we were creating. And it illustrated a massive opportunity to me. And, you know, it took several years, but I eventually left to pursue it. Yeah. Before we get into the business, I mean, just personally, I'm just super interested in the this paradigm shift to e-commerce. And I think you were right in the mix on that. What an interesting sector and uh, position to be covering. What are some of those those trends that your firm was predicting and you were effectively selling at the time? And, and as you've seen some of that play out over the last couple of years from an outside in perspective, what are some things that you know came true or didn't come true? And, and what do you think is happening in e-commerce? Yeah, that's a great question. And it started in July of 2015. Our Cowan released a report from one of our internet analysts upgrading Amazon as a stock. And so at that time, Amazon had been flat for like like 10 years, like 200 bucks, like, you know, around there. And this analyst had a survey of 2,500 people that he conducted monthly. And it was asked them all types of consumer behavior data questions. And his survey was picking up that the amount of people that were shopping, not only online, but specifically with Amazon, and the amount of people that were becoming Amazon Prime members were spiking. 
And we made a call, we upgraded the stock and made a call that Amazon would be the biggest retailer in the US by the end of 2017. And everyone that we spoke to told us that we were absolutely insane. And so that was the first real experience for me, like of thinking something and being the only one in the room believing it and having the confidence to stay with that opinion and then it becoming true. And what I learned is that if everyone agrees with your ideas, then you're probably late. And that was a learning experience for me that the most upside comes when you're early and that in order to be early, many people are going to disagree with you. And so having the confidence to be able to withstand everyone else's opinions and stay true to sort of your ideas and your conviction, for me, that was really good personal experience. And then obviously it just like confirmed the fact that e was the place to go. By the way, Amazon became the biggest retailer in the US before the end of 2016. Yeah, so great call on that one. I think building conviction like that is so critical. And that's something you don't, I mean, you don't learn in school definitely. And really a lot of people don't get the opportunity to learn that until later in their career. Like it's really all about coming up with conviction. Ideally, you go in the opposite direction of majority and then being able to gut out that conviction until it comes true, right? Or until you're wrong, but either way. 100%. I think Jeff Bezos is, is a great example of that where he's losing money for 15 years, but he was confident in his own vision and he kept it going and found people to believe in his vision. And obviously, you know, the execution and the vision was spot on, but there is pain in between that and you need to be able to withstand it. Definitely. Couldn't have had a better segue, have pain and need to withstand it to, to CBD. So, you know, CBD has been around for a few years now. And I think it's, it's a bit murky in terms of what people actually understand about it, what the medicinal effects are and aren't. So could you, you know, for people who are listening that have heard the buzzword CBD, but might not know really what it does, just give us like a quick snapshot of how CBD works in the body, why it's so great for you, and and potentially why there's been some negative stigmas around it. Okay, so in order to answer that question properly, I need to give you the background uh, because the number one thing that you're going to hear whenever talking about studies or research done around CBD to confirm anything that it's being claimed to benefit is there hasn't been enough research done. And so that is that is the number one thing. But it, the most important thing is to understand why there hasn't been any research done. And that's because up until late 2018, it was illegal to do studies on within the United States of America. Why? Because it was a level one substance considered by the DEA more serious than heroin and cocaine. The law was enacted in 1937 after um, alcohol was not illegal anymore and they needed something else to, to attack and they needed something else to go after and they made laws that essentially made not only marijuana, but hemp, which is what CBD is produced from, illegal on the federal level, a level one substance. And the rhetoric and the propaganda behind that law was built on a a false and racist narrative. And fast forward, and nobody has questioned it until 2014. And this is these laws have been the main reason to lead to our industrialized prison complex and one fourth of Americans, mostly minorities, being in jail currently. And these laws have been preventing research on a plant that the earth provides us and that has anecdotally benefited millions of people, yet our government agencies don't even allow us to study it, even though the pills that are replacing it are toxicity levels of multiples as of cannabis and lead to addiction and the opioid crisis that we're currently dealing with. And so obviously, Right now, we're maybe not a perfectly oiled machine as a as a as a government, 
but one thing is for sure that 70 when 70 percent of people um believe in something and want it to be legalized it eventually happens and that's what happened at the end of 2018. and so the most common reasons that we hear from our customers on why they use our products anxiety is hands down the number one and then sleep or you know reducing anxiety before sleep pain inflammation as well as um, anti-inflammatory and so those are you know really the the main use cases that we hear but again i can't sit here and say that that is proven in any studies but studies take five years and that there's a wide belief that the studies will confirm what's going on in the market definitely and i, I think the timing of the legislation maps 100 percent to to this like spike we've seen in direct to consumer businesses in the cbd space and kind of the next question i wanted to ask was you know from the e-com coverage we live in this crazy time where people can take two days put up a shopify site and start pouring money into instagram ads and have a company that people consume with and purchase products immediately how do you drive legitimacy around your brand and and i'm assuming the few cbd brands at the top of the the pyramid that are high quality and drive significant results versus all these other you know phony competitors that have false claims how do you prove that legitimacy between the different businesses it starts with treating the plant with respect and to treat it as if it is a living a living person because it is it's a plant that the earth produces and that deserves at least us studying and looking into and I think in terms of how we differentiate yourself, it's really with our approach in terms of how we're educating our consumers on the benefits of CPD. We are not claiming anything egregious. We are letting them know that many people, including our customers, which we have thousands of reviews where you can see firsthand of how maybe you can incorporate into your life. We make quality products that are meant to solve different problems that people are going through. And so we educate people through authentic and genuine content, not only that we put out, but that our customers put out. And we, we encourage uh, user-generated content, we encourage reviews. And what we have found is that when someone finds a product that actually helps their quality of life and makes them feel better, whether it's mentally, physically, or both, they want to tell their friends, they want to tell their family, and they, they want to show appreciation to us. And a lot of times that comes in the form of telling, telling people about it, writing reviews, and posting Instagram stories, which all just really lead to building a true community of customers that don't just purchase one time. It is really easy to acquire a first time customer. Anybody can do it with cash. It's really hard to acquire to the, that customer to purchase again. And what we're proud about is that we are just shy of the 50% customer repurchase rate, which for e -com is unheard of. And that is literally all we focus on because we view customer acquisitions going to happen over time. But if we can focus on retaining customers, understanding how their experience was, so that we can constantly be optimizing that, that's really where we focus our time. Definitely. A big reason why people are taking CBD and, and a lot of these products is this anxiety. And I feel like we, we've never lived in a, in a crazier time for anxiety, a heightened time for anxiety. And, you know, given the amount of customers that you're interacting with, I'd love to get your take on, you know, why do you think society today has such a heightened sense of anxiety and feeling of anxiety and people are reaching out for these different solutions like why do you think this is happening from your perspective we could do another like four hour podcast on this <laughs> as, truly but i think when it comes down to it um it's technology and it's social media and like i i like to use the example of like just like a, a young like a young male like 18 to 24 20 to 25 years ago their idea of success was 
like their neighbor down the road who had a little bit of a nicer car, a little bit of a bigger house. They had the in-ground pool instead of the above-ground pool, and that's what they were striving for. And if they came close to that, like they, they'd be happy. Right now, those 18 to 24 males, when they're in that sort of you know, maturation stage, have Dan Belzerian as their benchmark. And they see his lifestyle, and they think that it's possible and that it's something that could happen. And now anything short of that, they don't feel accomplished about anything. And they don't feel accomplished about their lives because they have these benchmarks that have never, ever been out there before that are now the, the inspiration. Where if you do the math, 0.0000% of people will achieve that success. But I think that things like social media has almost like I just exacerbated that problem where the people on social media are the ones that are, you know, flaunting their best lives. And you have FOMO and you compare yourself to everyone that you're seeing on average, people are spending like 90 days on 90 uh, minutes a day on social media. So seeing that constantly creates anxiety. And then not to mention all the geopolitical stuff that we have going on where like, I don't care if you look back in a 200 year time frame what's going on right now is unique and it's a natural reaction to feel anxious considering the you know the hyperbolic state of our country it's crazy i feel like on social that this combination of like what you're saying the awareness like you, you didn't have awareness to the 0.0001 percent of what was going on plus the instant gratification which is like inherently built in with the likes and the features that combination is terrible. And, and I'm, I'm curious to get your take on, and this is the last question I'll ask about it, and then we can shift to the businesses. You know, if you, there were to draw a graph, there's a line going up and up and up, the anxiety heightens and heightens. Like, what's the cliff, right? Like, what ends up happening 10, 15 years from now? Is it like political mandates that social media is banned or the other side, which none of us want to see, which is like continually increasing suicide rates and things like that? Like, what, what do you think ends up happening to get us out of this? trajectory my like gut instinctual answer would probably be considered dark but in order to solve this problem it needs to be a communal focus and a mutual understanding from everyone about the downsides of social media and the way that it rewires your mindset and really promotes um anxiety and mental health issues and The problem with that is that we live in a capitalist society. And the problem with that is that both um, the left and the right and the people that are responsible for lawmaking also use Facebook for Instagram ads. And so that's a conflict of interest where the um, the natural solution may be imposed because there are conflicting interests in terms of who Instagram benefits. And then not to mention, it comes down to uh, freedom of speech. And that is something that is incredibly hard to change. And I think that in order for us to evolve, if you look back at history, evolution usually occurs, at least in society when there's a catalyst and it tends to occur after a negative catalyst. And optimistically, I hope that coronavirus was the negative catalyst and that we will find our footing and that we will work to improve on the things that clearly need improvement. But, you know, with that said, weirder things have happened and if we don't get the wake-up call from coronavirus and what's going on with our elections in 2016 2020 and capitalist capitalism succeeds over doing what's right for democracy like there might be an even greater negative catalyst that forces us to reevaluate but uh, you know it that's a very loaded question um and i hope that coronavirus serves as a wake-up call so that 
we do adjust some things and we understand the downside to social media from a suicide rate perspective, also an anxiety perspective and, uh, you know, and just like a false reality in terms of a lot of the narratives that are being distributed on it. Yeah, I do too. I think there, fortunately there's never been a bigger spotlight on it and, you know, on, on the, on the downside, it's never been worse. So we'll see, we'll see which force plays out. Um, you know, shifting back to the business, a topic I love to get to is marketing and growth. And you mentioned the the way you guys think about acquisition costs, not that it's, you know, impossibly easy, but it's definitely not the, not the harder thing. And I agree, right? Retention's harder. Can you walk through what are some of the tactics, either conventional or especially like outside the box things that you've tried either on the acquisition side or the community building retention side that have seemed to work really well for Highline Wellness that you might not have seen, you know, in every D2C playbook across the internet? Yeah, for sure. So I think that for us, in terms of being outside the box, in terms of how we think about marketing, our whole structure is required to be outside of the box because as a CBD company, the inherent channels that every DTC uses to scale are, is not available. We can't do Google AdWords, we can't do Instagram ads, we can't do Facebook ads. We're just getting around getting approved for podcast ads. So there are a lot of the DTC channels are not available to us, which also prevents an opportunity because that deters the DTC DNA from going into the CBD space because their tools aren't available to them. So, and what they've used to scale other campaigns are not available to them, which was the impetus for the first CBD companies and that first 1.0 wave to focus on store count exclusively. Our view going in was that at the time of we launched, 5% of sales in all of CBD were occurring online versus every other industry at 50 to 60 percent so we made the very simple hypothesis that that market will go from five percent to 40 or 50 percent just like every other industry within a couple of years and so we built our brand we decided to build our brand exclusively online to capture that growth market and be a part of a shared gainer rather than a shared donor the way that we tested that hypothesis was we made a list of 150 people pre-launch and we sent them a box of our products three products very photographable um box and we sent 150 of them to friends influencers family within our network and that we asked them to post on their instagram story pretty much everyone posted i think i harassed maybe five to ten people something like that everyone eventually posted and that acquired our first 1500 customers and so for us we just sent out our 150 box of our products there was a certain cost associated with doing that and when we did the math if one box acquired one customer math makes sense and so that's what we tested on a small scale. It worked. And then we started, more importantly, it gave us an insight into what messaging worked for what crowds and why people were using the products, which was the number one thing we were trying to do is learn. And so that helped us learn so that when we actually put money to work towards advertising, we already, we weren't going in blind. We had just proven proof. We just had proof of concept. And now we're just scaling something that we've already proven to work rather than betting big on something we have no idea if it's going to work or not. Yeah, that's really interesting. So are, are your biggest channels then today, is it mostly like influencer, you know, shout outs or, or your direct placements with influencers versus the traditional? Yeah. So we, our model is on any given month, we have 100 to 150 people that are getting gifted our products and that are making content around that we get to sort of identify which partners are the right fit. And then we will create a roster of paid influencers that we do more sort of uh, unique and more meaningful collaborations with over a longer period of time. And then, yeah, so that's 
that's a majority of our spend. And then we try to incorporate, you know, our new product launches, our, you know, all the different things that we have going on. We like to also have a PR element to that and to get the hands and products of editors and things of that nature. So that's another great customer acquisition uh, channel for us. Definitely plays right into what you're trying to do with community buildings. I feel like influencers are the fastest way to build authentic community versus buying people on Instagram, buying people on Facebook, et cetera. So it's, it works out that way. 100%, but it's, it's an art, not a science. And depending on who you partner with, you get that genuine and authentic feel from. And it's not a million followers here doesn't necessarily mean a million followers here. It's all about why they're following that person and what community that they're building and what they're looking for in terms of following whoever that brand ambassador influencer is. Totally. And so when you look forward, what do you think has to happen for Highlight Wellness to 10x where it is today? I'm sure, so you have the banking background and I'm sure you think about this strategically a lot, right? Yeah. To an order of magnitude bigger, what do you have to, what do you think has to happen? It could happen next month. Right now, depending on who you ask, whether it's the DEA or the FDA, they'll have two different answers, whether CBD is legal. Whole Whole Foods can't carry CBD. Um, Nobody nationally can carry CBD ingestibles. So the only products that are anywhere distributed right now are topicals. And so it's first inning in terms of legislation. So we're working in this gray area right now. But if you were to think that next month the the senate flips and goes from republican to democrat the democrats have made it very clear that they are prioritizing the moore act which is the marijuana expungement um an opportunity uh, expungement marijuana opportunity reform and expungement act and so what that essentially does is it de uh schedulizes Uh, cannabis, which includes hemp and marijuana, so CBD and THC, from the federal substance list, which allows banking system to finally touch cannabis companies. And so now all the big CPG players and, and all of the banks can now give capital to the cannabis industry, and now investors can now invest in the space. And so capital is what leads to growth. And so there's a, I'm not, you know, I'm not, it's way above my pay grade to know if the Senate is going to flip, but right. just by reading, it seems as if a 50, 50 likelihood is a fair thing to say. And so if that does happen, the industry is going to explode from a distribution standpoint, but also a legality standpoint. And I think that's the first step. And then the second step is we are entering into the THC market. So we're going to leverage the brand that we've built with Highline Wellness through CBD on a national level to then go and um, get licenses in states that THC is medicinally or recreationally legal and sell our products specifically with a focus on our gummies into dispensaries within that state. And so that's sort of, for us, the when you ask about, you know, going vertical on the S-curve or 10x growth, I think those are the two catalysts that I'm looking at and I'm spending the most of my time executing on. I mean, complementing with the with the THC side makes a ton of sense. When you think about like doubling down, tripling down, putting a lot of resource allocation there, is it just that there's a broader base of people that use those products today versus CBD? Is it better margins? Like what's the what's the strategy? around that choice the way we look at it like the thc market for gummies in like california oregon nevada is bigger than the national cbd market so the companies that are crushing it in those four states are the ones that were set up early and medicinally through through medicinal brands So we think we have an opportunity to enter the market right now and leverage the fact that our primary customer base is in the tri-state area, which represent the growth states in the next couple of years. 
Um, and so we want to have a footprint there. So we capture that growth and that market share as that market explodes. Yeah. My next question was going to be like, if you manifest the next five to 10 years, what does Highline Wellness look like? I think you answered a lot of it there in that it's, it's two pronged. You've got the CBD and the THC side. Do you have any other thoughts around what does the product mix evolve to at five to 10 year scale? You'll probably have licenses in several States in a bigger footprint. So like, what else are you thinking about? So actually, I've I've been really interested and in personally reading about psilocybin. And uh, for for those that don't know what psilocybin is, it's it's magical mushrooms. Um, it's the psychedelic version of mushrooms. And there has been an outrageous amount of studies that have been conducted recently that show benefits from everything from PTSD, depression, um, as well as um, addiction. And from firsthand, I believe in mushrooms and I believe in the therapeutic effect of psilocybin. And so I don't know if that's going to be sort of a part of Highline Wellness specifically, but personally, I do think that there is a tremendous opportunity and that the shift that will occur in psilocybin will actually be greater than the shift uh, in cannabis. And that, you know, we're on, we're in the first inning of a massive transformation from our society looking at pills first as their solution to different ailments to now focusing and refocusing on plants and natural remedies that have been given to us, you know, from the earth but for a reason that we've been, you know, making illegal to study for years. And so we just want to be on the forefront of, of that movement and CBD, THC, and possibly eventually psilocybin and, and doing that in the right way and providing a trusted partner in industries that are nuanced and untrusted is is really what we're trying to accomplish, uh, you know, from a high level. Definitely, yeah. The, the psilocybin piece, I think, there's a massive opportunity with almost no infrastructure pre-built. There are like almost no companies that have been set up for that, so it's complete white space. Zero. I mean, there's money getting into it now, and very smart people are getting into it now, and that's changing very quickly. But th- there, it's still super early and it's like cannabis 10 years ago yeah and you can you can start to pattern match with that and you see what happened with with cannabis and it's still super super nascent and you look at psilocybin and all of a sudden you're like wait this is about to happen again and the playbook is really occurring where the same states that legalized uh cannabis first are now legalizing psilocybin with oregon and california addressing their laws colorado addressing their laws it's it's happening and it, it's going to be here before these things happen quicker than anyone thinks, especially when the government needs tax dollars. <laughs> totally. I think it's, it's easy for, for founders to come on here and like, you know, tell a good narrative and everything's good. But I think where people really get valuable learnings is in what hasn't worked. So without trashing the brand or giving away any like trade secrets, you know, if you were to think back, like what are some of the things that really haven't worked um, and, and that you've learned from? Literally a million. Um, what hasn't worked was a culture where not everyone's on the same page. Um, what hasn't worked was poor communication. What hasn't worked was taking offense to criticism. Um, and those are all really cultural things that as a startup, you go through and when you have the right team you're you're able to talk about those things and 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 not brush them under the rug and address them and learn and build accordingly and improve constantly and so i think culturally that that's what i would point to because i do think culture is the most important thing um and then secondly big bets on things that haven't been confirmed and so we have a rule that we don't spend more than $5,000 on an idea that we have not tested in a much smaller scale. And so if we're going to try something new, we might think it's going to work. Everyone might be 
100% confident that it's going to work, guess what? It might not. And if you make bets on what you think is going to happen, happening, that's when you can get in trouble really quickly. And so we've, you know, developed the process of, all right, we have an idea. How do we test that idea at a small scale, learn from it, decipher what metrics we're going to use to determine whether it's a success or a failure? If it's, uh, if it's deemed a success, then how do we scale that and how do we scale it? I want to double click on that culture piece. The next question I was going to ask is around hiring and, and kind of what you look for in the superstars that you've brought on. And I think it it pairs really well with the culture side and that, you know, like, how do you think about building the right culture? I think every company has their own right culture, but how do you think about it based on what you've learned? For me, it is, it's all about mindset. And that is applicable to when we're thinking about hiring people and and who we hire, but it's also applicable to our culture as a company. So I think like in life, there are, there are inherently situations where you are going to get bad news somewhat consistently. And so for a startup, bad news is like, I mean, it's breakfast. it's breakfast, lunch, dinner, and all four snacks throughout the day. <laughs> and so how do you turn that bad news into fuel or positivity? And how do you react under pressure when something didn't go well? And those are the things that I'm most concerned about. Uh, and when I'm building out the team, but also building out the culture, because by nature for a direct consumer brand, someone that is good at a certain skill set could be the best in the business for six months. But then as the algos change and things become different, if you're not committed to constantly be evolving, you become obsolete every time the algo changes. And so one of the things we always talk about is like, we don't know anything. Like know what you don't know, know where your blind spots are and fill them with quality people that are committed to the long-term vision, but more importantly are like-minded in terms of their mindset and how they approach the world, problem solving, um, you know, negative situations, that's really the thing I'm concerned about because if you get a group of people that are committed to growth mindset and to constantly be evolving and you set it up so that you can't really make massive mistakes, you know, it, it's tough to have those blow up months and all you have to do is not quit. commit to that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. I'm sure it's been a crazy two years for you. When you think back, if you could teleport back and tell yourself a couple things that you learned or, or things to, to do differently, what do you think those things would be? Full knowing that you had to go through the tough parts to get to where you are and learn, but what do you think some of those points of wisdom would be? There are a lot. I would say trusting your gut is is one of them where, you know, tr- trust your gut. And once you've made a decision to make it and, you know, act, act decisively and, and commit and then be expected to make mistakes and to just be patient on the macro level of when you're not having a month that you thought you'd have, that would affect my personality and my overall happiness levels and detaching yourself from the performance of the company from a mental health perspective is incredibly important because the first year was pure mayhem. Like mistake more mistakes you can ever imagine if the company's not doing well and that affects your personality, it's hard to set the right tone and be a leader and to get yourself out of that slump. And so to just stick to the process to, you know, be very even keeled and to expect mistakes, embrace mistakes and learn from them. Very well said. So I'm going to shift to a section I, I essentially call the wellness stack. I think overall wellness is like, I think of it like a stack. So like fitness, sleep, mindfulness, 
you know, nutrition, everything stacks on top of each other to create like compounding effects. That's how I think of wellness. So what I want to do is there's a, a few aspects of wellness that we'll go through and just, I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, how important it is to your daily routine. Do you, do you have a set process? How do you think about it? Are there products that you use, you know, other than, other than your own for, in certain categories? Uh, but before we go into the categories, just like, how do you think of wellness at a high level, right? Like how important it is, is it to you? And, and, you know, how do you think about it? Well, well, it's the most important thing that, that is my big, it, it hasn't always been this way, but what I've learned is it is the most important thing. And it's more important than anything else that you can do in life. So my number one goal as a person, every single day when I wake up is to be present for that day. And for me, if I'm able to be present, I'm able to be a good coworker, a good friend, a good son, a good brother, a good uncle, a good CEO, and a good person in general. And my number one concern is to be present. And for me, in order for me to be present, and it's different for everyone, and it takes time to identify what causes you to have good days and then once you identify hey you know what that was an awesome day what did i do and then to be make that become your routine is essentially how i back into it and for me yoga and meditation is is tremendous um and i essentially don't start the day from a work perspective until i do one or the other um, and sometimes I replace yoga with working out, going to the gym or doing different workout classes, but getting movement and breath work for me is the number one step to start the day. And then the other part of it is alcohol consumption and I spent the first six years of my career in finance on wall street on a sales role. I was out four nights a week late. Up at 5:30, Barry's boot camps, getting no sleep, and that creates a ton of anxiety. And you don't know it happens until it's too late. And so retroactively, I realized I need more sleep, and I also got more anxiety after I drank. And so for me, it's really an all-encompassing approach of limiting um, the drinking. And then also prioritizing working out and meditating before I start the day. And for me, that that's what I have found helps me have a higher tolerance for stress. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I was going to double click into some of those, but you crossed off a few on the list already. That the the mindfulness piece is is huge for me as well. Do you want to just talk about like do you have a specific practice that's worked for you, or do you kind of dabble with different types of of yoga meditation? Like what what's what's worked for you best? I, I dabble all across. I'll go on YouTube. I, uh, one of our brand ambassadors is Melissa Wood Health. She does awesome yoga classes and she has like a $10 a month subscription that uh, she, yeah, I've been doing her yogas from home and you don't need to do them for like an hour. For me, yoga is like a forced meditation because if you're doing yoga properly, you're focusing on your breath. And when you're focusing on your breath and you're thinking about your breath, you don't have room to think about other things. And so it gives your mind a break and it also, you know, uh, distributes oxygen to your nervous system and gets your body, you know, functioning, functioning properly. So I think breath work and, and is really important. How do you think about the content diet? So you, you seem like someone who consumes enough news to know what's going on geopolitically, but you've got a real good down to earth vibe. So I feel like you, you've dialed in the amount of content to consume. So how do you look at that? Like on a micro scale and then macro like books and, and different things that have helped you? Yeah, it's a great question. I can't help it. If it, I just read a lot and I'm a curious person. And so if I like see a headline that I think is weird, I'll spend two hours reading about <laughs> it and like getting up to speed. Um, it has gotten me into dark holes before for sure. Where, like I'm just wasting my time. Um, so for me, I always, it starts with objectivity and like you, I think you need to know that when you're reading something from Fox news, it's right bias. And when you're reading from something from CNN, it's left bias and that 
you need to be able to determine when it says opinion in New York Times, because there are opinion pieces in New York Times that read as if they're incredibly biased, but it's an opinion piece so they can do it. I don't think most people even know that opinion means that doesn't necessarily need to be based on fact. And so being really diligent about what content I'm consuming and also what bigger pieces, what bigger players have at stake and who benefits from that content is a way to gather a lot of information without being warped by misinformation. Totally. All right, we get three questions left for you and then we'll get you out of here. Um, the first one is around trend. So I think, you know, as, a, as an avid reader and a CEO, you're seeing a lot of things, of course, in your own industry and, and complementary spaces, but also all across the startup landscape. So if you were to put your kind of consumer hat on or like an angel investor hat, what are some other trends in areas that you're seeing for the next, you know, three to five years that really excite you? It's a great question. I think that from a high level, there's a shift occurring right now where, again, the legal um, status is delayed. But in reality, if you're not imp implementing it you're and you're still going after what the legal tells you to do, you're going to be um, penalized by the market and by your customers. And what I mean by that is historically, as a CEO or as a board of directors uh, member, you have one job by law. Your fiduciary duty is to very simply increase value for shareholders. At no point does it say increase value for shareholders while doing the right thing for the community. And so right now we have all these companies that are just trying to create value at the expense of doing the right thing and they're getting penalized for it and consumers are becoming way more diligent about how they spend their money who's behind the company and how that money is being reinvested into doing the right thing amongst your community lowering prices for people having good customer service and showing your customers that you care and so in my opinion Shocker, I think the way you do that is online. It's very, 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 very hard to do it in store and to create that true community and that true sense of doing the right thing. Um, and so I think that's a massive trend and that companies that have a real mission to to do better and to do good are finding that the wallet is shifting towards them and that those are the companies that will benefit. I think it's 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 incredibly inspiring to see. Um, and one of the most things, one of the things that we are most proud of is we donated just shy of over a hundred thousand dollars to charities in need in 2020 alone, and thousands upon thousands of products to to places in need. And so. When you're thinking about why we've been successful, I think that is one of the top of the list because it allows our customers to see truly what we stand for and and what we care about. And I think we we benefit from that in terms of you know creating a genuine community. Yeah, doing the right thing is the thing, right? Like when like when Patagonia was founded 25 year 30 years ago it was one of the only companies with like a sustainability first mission and it was so radically different right and you could see how that cult brand has grown and now if you don't build a company with that mission you're you're dead i feel like 100% they were an early mover for sure they were one of the first of its kind yeah totally two more questions for you we ask these to every guest so i'm pumped to get your take on these so the first one is the startup manifesto so you you've kind of layered in uh, some bits and pieces here and there, but if you had to write a startup manifesto with five of the most important key lessons or pitfalls to avoid when starting out, what would they be? The first step is to can gain conviction in your idea and don't let others' opinions deter you. And so by nature, human psychology, when you go and tell someone that you know that you're going to quit your job and that you're going to go start a company, 
nine times out of 10, that person is going to reply by telling you all of the reasons he or she did not start the company when they were thinking about doing the same thing. Because inherently, everyone sort of idolizes entrepreneurs, and a lot of people don't make that move. And so when for me, for example, when I told my family at Christmas that I quit my great job at an investment bank and I was going to sell weed, they thought I was... I was, you know, like making a horrendous decision. And, but I had the confidence and I expected them to do that. And I was able to turn that conversation into fuel, not in a resentful, resentful, toxic way, but in a healthy way of knowing that I'm going to see them at next Christmas. And I bet you their stance is going to change. And I find personally satisfaction of, being early to things and, you know, don't feel the need to explain yourself. You're, you're convicted. Now go execute. Second one is culture over everything and build a team with similar mindsets. And so, you know, three, you know, two people can perceive the exact same reality and their perception of that reality could be completely different. And that's each one of their own realities. And so you have to respect that and understand that, Everyone is wired differently and to find people that are similar in the sense of mindset and, and, and growth and um, able to receive feedback and to be a good teammate mixed with complementing yourself with very different skill sets is, is really the sweet spot. The third one is customer feedback is your business plan. And so you know, all our lives, we in from high school to college, we were taught to make a business plan. We were taught to make projections. Then we were taught to see how much profit we'd have to then project that in the next year. And guess what? If you make one assumption wrong, that entire thing is null and void. And so your goal is to test the market in very small pieces, get literally 20 customers, learn from them, reiterate, and then grow based on what your customers are telling you. And so all these, you know, I rather, if, if I'm selling, you know, a good that you, if you're buying a hundred units, you buy for $5. And if you buy a thousand, you're buying for $1. I'd rather buy a hundred units at five to learn about that from customers before making the thousand unit purchase order because without question things on that first product will be messed up and you have to expect that and you have to put yourself in the position to get feedback but not have an ego about it which is really tough fourth one is start small test small scale it works pretty much just said that uh, fifth one is encourage and embrace mistakes and use them as learning lessons. And so we think that innovation only comes when people feel comfortable doing new ideas and, and, and trying new ideas. And we think the team is the most powerful when all everyone's ideas are being heard. And so we have set up, again, internally, $5,000 test rule. And so every Everyone's ideas are heard. And if you have an idea, all we need to do is determine how to test that idea at a $5,000 or less scale. And we're expected, and we all expect that idea to fail. And so we don't have the constant disappointment of this new idea that we were excited about failing because that would just have a negative impact on our overall psyche. And so we've switched it and said, these are exposed to, these are expected to fail. Let's try them all. If they don't fail, it's a bonus and we'll scale it. But, you know, setting ourselves up to be comfortable with failure has been really powerful for us and has opened up the, the possibilities of, you know, new things. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that list. And then the second question that we ask everyone is, is a nomination. So this has been a fantastic way for the show to grow. 
Um, but it's, it's your turn to nominate another founder that is either a friend, colleague, or a mentor of yours that you'd like to see on the show in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Farron Wiener, her agency's name is Fahrenheit. They ran our rebrand and Farron is sent, she's on our advisory board, um, but she's also like our chief brand officer. And she runs Fahrenheit, which is a marketing agency. They call themselves a marketing SWAT team. And uh, they run pretty much all of our digital advertising, all of our um, all of our social media. And I think she'd be great to have on here. I think she'd like it. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks for that. We'll have to get her on. I really appreciate that. Before I let you go, I just want to acknowledge you for a second. I think, you know, I'm, I'm obviously hosting this and driving the questions, but I'm also listening as like a fan and, and, and learning. And I think there's a few things that I took away that are really impressive about you. The, the first one is you come off super down to earth, but you have a really good grasp of like the macro environment and how that applies to your particular industry. And, and I don't think all founders have that. Plus you have a really good ability to zoom in and zoom out. You, you can you can get real tactical and talk about actual experiments that your teams have run that have worked, not worked without ego. And then you can zoom way out and talk about the strategic landscape. And I, and I think that's also really inspiring. And, and if, if people take nothing away other than those two things, I think it'll be, it'll be an hour well spent. So I really want to thank you again for coming on and I'll be a huge fan and supporter of Highline Wellness and you guys as you, as you keep growing. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation. I'm happy to come on any other time. So I, uh, I appreciate it and uh, I can't wait for the next one. Thank you for listening to that episode with Chris Roth of Highline Wellness. If you're loving the show and want to support, there's a couple quick things you could do that would really help us out. One, sign up for our email list at thefounder.substack.com. We know you're busy and might not always have time to listen to the full episode each week. And that's okay. In addition to releasing the episode, each Tuesday, we will send a five-minute email update with a summary of the weekly conversation. We also plan to use that email list for fun giveaways in the future, so be sure to sign up. Two, subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts. If you go to Apple Podcasts, please leave us a five-star rating and a couple-sentence positive review on why the show inspired you. These ratings and reviews are super important and they signal to Apple that they should put our show in front of other people that might like it. Three, follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Founder Podcast. Each week we put out teasers, audio clips, and important quotes from the episode. And lastly, check out our website as a mission control for the show. Go to thefounderpod.com. We have a page on there called Special Offers where we link up discount codes from all the founders' companies as well as the books and resources that have been recommended. I hope you enjoyed that episode and are looking forward to the next one. Until then, I'm Callaway, and this is The Founder. Founder.